Hello, everyone. Welcome. We are so excited that so many of you could join us this evening for Exploring Rumi to make sense of ourselves. I'm Alex Elliott, the Senior Manager of Events and Engagement for the Public Programs Department of California Institute of Integral Studies, a nonprofit university in San Francisco. Um, now I'm going to introduce our presenters, uh, Melody Moezi and Shoshana Simons, and then we will get right into the conversation. Shoshana Simons is a professor and co-chair of CIIS's Expressive Arts Therapy Program and adjunct faculty in the Transformative Inquiry Department. Her extensive training and experience in the UK and the United States in community-based work with children and families, counseling, education, leadership, and systems change informs her passionate commitment to preparing expressive arts therapy students to transform mental health systems into humane, creative, life-affirming, and culturally responsive communities of practice. Melody Moezi is a writer, speaker, activist, commentator, columnist, attorney, and award-winning author. Her books include War on Error, Real Stories of American Muslims, and more recently, Haldol and Hyacinth, A Bipolar Life, which earned wide critical acclaim and broke new ground as the first mainstream mental health memoir by either a Muslim or a Middle Easterner. And now it's time to turn it over to Shoshana and Melody. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, <laughs> Melody. Hey! <laughs> long so, time no see. <laughs> long time no see, like a few minutes ago. Yeah. And we had the pleasure to meet on over the weekend. And we are both in our homes. And we're also in our little cafe area that we're creating to have an intimate conversation, I'm hoping, in the midst of however many people are tuning in. But um, I'm appreciating um, a sense of immediacy with you already. Mm, me too. And I'm really looking forward to uh, engaging you in your in a conversation that this is, your book is such a, an amazing starting point for what, what we're sitting with, what's troubling mm. our world right now, and it's affecting all of us. So what incredible timing for this <laughs> medicine that you have gathered <laughs> right for, yeah. for right now. Yeah, I always say I say in the book that the beloved's timing is better than mine and consistently has proven to be better than mine, but only in retrospect do you see that. So I don't see that right now, but come back to me in a year or five, we'll see. Uh, and maybe by the end of this conversation, we'll yeah, who knows? make some connections with that. So just in getting us started, I wanted to just say a few things. Um, well, about what I, what I, one of the things that we talked about in our pre-conversation, I asked you what would be meaning, might be meaningful to you um, as a question that I could ask you at, at, during this time together. And you, and you said it was really wanting to hear what's meaningful to your readers. Um, and I really took that to heart. And I love the question because it's also an invitation to connect with you, to connect my experience with your experience. And, um, I said right to you right before we got on this call, uh, this call, this cafe, this conversation was the end of your book felt like the call for the beginning. You know, there's that circularity about it because it's so rooted in your, your history, um, the place where all of the parts of you, past, present and future come together um, and the wisdom of your ancestors. And it's a call, I think, for me as a reader or for any reader to situate this wisdom in our own traditions and our own teachings. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm inviting that into the conversation. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, thank you. And uh, maybe that's also something to say to the folks that are listening, at, that as, as you all are listening and watching us, to be thinking about how does this connect for you with your own traditions? Um, it really feels like the heart and soul of what what's going on. So the other thing that's the only part of this that feels a little bit structured is that I wanted to start by um, sort of Im imbuing the spirit of these of, of these prescriptions into this time with everyone who's who's tuning in by reading, um, reading a poem that 
is attributed to Rumi, and I'm being very careful here because yeah. Melody and I spoke about this beforehand. It's attributed to Rumi, but there's some question as to whether it was actually written by Rumi or it's apocryphal, but we do know it's in English and it's in Farsi, and it certainly embodies the spirit of Rumi. So as I read it, I'm gonna just invite everyone who's on this call to arrive, sometimes being on Zoom, we're sort of a little bit outside of our own bodies. So just like getting, feeling into your own body and also feeling this incredible connection outside of space and time with each other. Because again, actually Zoom allows us to be in community without actually being physically co-located. And I'm gonna read this poem for us. Only breath, as translated by Coleman Box. Not Christian or Jew, or Muslim, not Hindu, Buddhist, Sufi, or Zen, not any religion or cultural system. I'm not from the East or the West, not out of the ocean or up from the ground, not natural or ethereal, not composed of elements at all. I do not exist. I'm not an entity in this world or in the next. Did not descend from Adam and Eve, or any origin story. My place is placeless, a trace of the traceless, neither body or soul. I belong to the beloved, have seen the two worlds as one, and that one call to and know, first, last, outer, inner, only that breath, breathing human being. So with that, how does this inform, in a nutshell, this book that you've created, knowing that most of the folks here in the call probably haven't read it yet? Sure. Um, just to give you a sense of the book itself, I, I yeah. would say each, this book is not a collection of just translations of Rumi's work. There are translations in each chapter, but the, the chapters are different diagnoses. I call them diagnoses. Uh, but they're basic human emotions from wanting to depression, to fear, to anger, to disappointment, uh, part of the human condition, right? So each chapter is a different diagnosis and a different prescription or set series of prescriptions, um, focusing on one, which to me was, seemed to be the prescription that I gleaned uh, from Rumi's work and not just from Rumi's work, from my father's interpretation of Rumi's work for me, um, he is very much a Rumi addict, uh, and like most children of addicts, I grew up resenting the object of my father's addiction, uh, being Rumi, uh, and it wasn't until later in my life that I actually came to uh, his work uh, through a series of events I'm sure we'll get into, but effectively losing my mind um, and opening my heart, uh, waking up to intuition and shutting down intellect. Uh, and when that happened, suddenly this poetry made sense to me that my father had been reciting to me my entire life. Mm. Um, so I forget now what the original question was, but I was just giving- Exactly that. It was just about, about realizing that most people won't have read the book. So yeah. in a nutshell, what are you in, what's the pathway that you're opening up to introduce yeah. us to? So the first thing that catches my attention is the, well, an idea, um, uh, uh, the idea about sanity some ideas about what does sanity mean yeah um and the fact that your father called you in and brought you in to Rumi as a healing balm mm. as a wisdom and as a as someone who's worked with with the mental health system in a, a kind of against the dominant mental health system yeah. my entire adult life yeah <laughs> Um, and because I'm in the expressive arts therapy world in particular, um, I'm really interested and curious to hear, hear how you would compare the medicine of Rumi with the medicine of um, the more conventional, what, what, we, what we actually formally name as medicine within right. the health field. Uh, so my father is a physician. Uh, and the reason I call it the Rumi prescription is because he actually writes these down as prescriptions mm -hmm. for me. Um, but the, in terms of the mental health system here and in so many other places around the world, it's centered on dehumanization. Um, whereas Rumi is centered on spiritualization. Like these couldn't even be farther apart from each other. 
like Rumi says, we're not human, we're spirit. Like we're beyond, there is no self, the self is all connected, is one, right? Our, the system says, oh, you want a self? We'll give you even less than that. <laughs> the system is beyond dehumanizing. And for me, the immediate recognition of that was being hospitalized and having acute mania within 24 hours of a period of having a beautiful, beautiful mystical experience. Um, like I, I've had two mystical experiences in my life. This was the second. It was far more intense than the first. And it was the first had no damaging side effects. The second had a lot, uh, which included acute mania and psychosis. I believe I am so grateful to the medicine that, that brought me out of mania. I'm so grateful for antipsychotics um, specifically because I, I, that is a huge part of my treatment, not daily. Uh, very rarely do I take them, but when I need to take an antipsychotic, thank God that th those are available to me. I do see them often overused. Um, there was a year, several years back where one of these antipsychotics was like the best selling drug, uh, in the country, uh, which is crazy. Cause it's meant to treat like a whole separate, like really serious kind of crazy. Uh, and we were giving it to everyone. Uh, so anyway, the, the mental health system in terms of how it treats that, uh, putting me in isolation, literally putting me in isolation is a treatment for mania. Uh, and I, and every time I say that, I always also have to say, here in the United States, we live in a country where we use, you can call it isolation, seclusion, solitary confinement is what I call it. Uh, we use it more than any other country on the planet. We use it for treatment and for punishment. It works for neither. In fact, it's counterproductive. It induces symptoms of mental illness in people who mm -hmm. don't already have it. And I know Shoshana, based on your work, you know all of this already. Um, anybody who studies this for just a tiny amount of time knows this. Mm -hmm. Why our system can't fix it, I have no idea. Um, but that isolation is very much the opposite of what Rumi teaches is the way that you bring your soul back, the way you bring your, you wake up. It's not that anything is gone or that you're missing anything, but the way that you wake up to the, to the gold, the beauty, the love, the divine within yourself is not through isolation, but through community, right? Reconnecting. Um, and what we do to people in mental health crises is we disconnect them. And that is a beautiful way to make them sicker. Uh, and, and that certainly happened to me. And not just that, to traumatize them, which is why I'm a huge, and I know you are as well, a huge fan of trauma-informed care. Mm -hmm. of what we call culturally competent care, which mm -hmm. honestly to me is just listen. I don't, like, I don't expect my mental health provider to know everything about Islam, but I expect when I say something about Islam that my mental health provider who is not Muslim and doesn't know anything about Islam doesn't say to me, no, no, that's not Islam, <laughs> which happened to me, you know? Um, just listen, it's, it's really um, not that hard. And I think yeah. the, in, the human instinct to help is there, but there, there's a hierarchy. And, and when it comes to mental health, it's, it's more, worse than it is in the rest of the medical community, I think. Uh, because I had a pancreatic tumor. So I spent a lot of time in the hospital for that. And that was deeply dehumanizing. Mm -hmm. Nothing, nothing wow. compared to the way I was treated in the psychiatric facility. So uh, obviously I have a lot of feelings about yeah. that. Quite rightly so. And it just, it makes me think about how little, how little has changed over the years when it comes to the, the psychiatric um, end of the mental health profession. That those things may have shifted in terms of psychotherapy and the um, services that are available for folks who are in private practice, when we get to state mental hospitals, not so much has shifted. In fact, yeah. things are pretty similar. Um, and before, when I, I, I when we had our pre conversation, I also shared with Melody that this why this issue is so important to my heart is because my mother died in a mental a mental hospital, withdrawing from prescribed medications. So this is like my life passion and um, involves, and it's the heart of my activism and my joy in doing the work is this, this thread that connects my work with your work actually. Um, I've got all, I keep looking away cause I've written all these notes and I'm like, oh, we're not on page thing. <laughs> Something that I wrote exactly about this. I was drawn to some things that you were saying um, in the book about um, some definitions of Rumi talking about madness. Right. And mm. the, some of the distinctions that he was making between 
you know, kind of ecstatic, crazy. The, the, there's a craziness that is about the ecstatic experience. And right. you use the term in the book, post-ecstatic. Yeah. <laughs> if you define, how do you know the difference between post-ecstatic experience and post-traumatic experience? Mm. How do you know, what tells you there's a difference? Um, there, I don't think there's a difference in terms of what they are. I think there's a difference in terms of how they're expressed and how society accepts them, I, if okay. that makes sense. I, so I think- Say a little bit more about that. So the, I think the trauma is, so we see trauma as something negative, right? We don't see it as an opening. Yeah. We, we don't see it as an opportunity. And for me, every time I've been broken, whether it yes. was physically with that pancreatic tumor or psychologically with um, still physically, mentally, whatever you want to call it, my brain is still physically part of my body. So whether it was with the pancreatic tumor or whether it was the, with the bipolar disorder, every time I have broken, I have been able to put myself back together in better and more beautiful ways. Um, and I think, and I write it in the book about a friend of mine who I lost to suicide, who I see as yeah. Yeah. the perfect example of this because she, she was this wonderful artist on so many levels and she would put together uh, these gorgeous mosaics as just a reflection of how she, um, her path to recovery. And though we lost her, she was still such a great and remains such a great example uh, for me, even in her death, an example of, wow, I can get to a place where I feel like I'm recovered. Cause she was just like me. Like she was an advocate. She was a writer. She was an artist. She had this down, she was teaching other people. So I think like in her example, for instance, I saw her as somebody I looked up to and I realized I was so busy looking up to her that I wasn't looking out for her. And for me, for my readers, when they think like, oh, you have, and I often I'll introduce at events like, oh, she's overcome bipolar disorder, which is bullshit, but um, I live with it. I, I didn't need to overcome it. I'm living with it. But, um, but that idea that like, oh, you, you've overcome it and then you don't have to continue thinking about it. Um, her experience taught me that this is something I'm gonna be managing and dealing with right. for the rest of my life as both a blessing and a curse. And we live in such a binary society that yes. it's very hard for us to recognize that something can be both right. at the same time. And that goes back to the psychiatric condition of just the clinical experience of having mania and psychosis, which were valid, but also the spiritual experience of having this beautiful mystical experience of ecstatic experience of being feeling the connection to every other living thing on the planet mm -hmm. in a way I'd never had before. That was valid too. And the medical community should not have told me it was not valid. They shouldn't have told me that it was garbage. And likewise, the faith community should never have told me, don't take your medication, you're just possessed. Like Both of them are fucked up. Like I don't want either one of these. And why can't we have both? And I, again, it comes back to our society of living in this binary mm -hmm. of, and it, it has a lot to do with gender. It has a lot to do with race and other things as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do think that's part of it. Yeah. As you're talking, I'm thinking about the, cu the cultural aspects of this and, and within the dominant culture of this idea of overcoming, that there is a, some kind of a, underneath that, there's an idea of a norm of ways of being and standards of normality that we can actually fit ourselves into um, and that we can approximate who knows what it is, but it seems to be something to do with the dominant culture. Yeah. And it used to be something to do with being able to suppress our emotions um, and look good on the outside. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the undercurrents that I hear in your book is that tension, is hearing that tension between that is the medicine. I keep hearing that I'm supposed to be this way and I keep trying to achieve, trying to achieve, trying to achieve, and it's always elusive. Mm -hmm. And then there's your father's voice always coming in well you know here's the medicine and here's yeah. this prescription and I see you trying that again but try this one and take on this one and and yeah. that coming back tethering back to this deeper wisdom that the medicine is in is in the obstacle hmm. also translates into Jewish mysticism which is sort of my you know we also established that we were on these parallel cousin yeah parts, which is so sweet and I'm also, I'm thinking about a particular um, per person who was diagnosed um, as schizophrenic that um, 
I've had in my life, known in my life. And I remember feeling really concerned that she was talking about these voices that she was mm -hmm. hearing. I'm like, oh my God, is she okay? Is she okay? And then and that's the, that's the mental health system, conventional part mm -hmm. of me. It's like, is she okay? Is she okay? Yeah. She should have been, those voices are dangerous until I became really curious. And I said, tell me what the voices are saying. Are any of them friendly? Mm -hmm. And she said, oh yeah, I have these voices. They are so friendly. And they're telling me, you can do it, you can do it. You know, and it's like stepping back and realizing how much we as um, mental health workers or healers or however we wanna position ourselves right. are so much of creating, co-creating either an opening right. to understand how the, the um, diagnosis itself right. has the potential for wisdom and how much we are suppressing it because of our own fear. Mm, yeah, and I, that's why I call these diagnoses because I know all of these things that I talk about with pride, like that's, you know, mm -hmm. but you calling like the, the system calling what I have bipolar disorder is as much a diagnosis as pride to me. I mean, it's, it's a valid and important diagnosis in terms of how much, like what kind of treatments I, I might or might not right. pursue. Um, and, and I believe in that part of it, but I also believe there is so much that we do not know about what I call conditions, um, what the medical community still likes to call disorders and illnesses. And I still mess up and call it a disorder and illness because it's been internalized as well sometimes. Uh, but I've grown to see it as a condition, as something that, that so, right before, frequently I get friends calling saying, I have a friend of a friend who is dealing with so-and-so, their partner who's in the midst of a manic episode or a crisis or whatever. Uh, we know you've gone through this and you're functional in society. You're not delusional. You're not jumping off buildings. Like tell us, tell, can you help us in some way? Um, and I just like, right before we, we came on, I just got one of these sort of requests and and it's a request by someone who like the person we're thinking about is like the most successful person you could ever imagine and the only reason they need help is because and like deeply rooted in medicine and the medical community they need help because there there's a secret you know like we can't we can't talk about this within our community because there's mm -hmm. fear of losing status, of losing position, mm -hmm. of losing really valid fears of losing your job, losing a lot of things. Um, so how does someone like that get help without being brought yes. down and humiliated yeah. and dehumanized? Um, and I, I think there's a way to do it. And I, it's the same way of like this, what they did to me when I had a pancreatic tumor. No, no one ever thought to say like, what, this is not even, like, just don't tell anybody about it. God forbid someone knows you have, you know, a pseudopapillary tumor of the pancreas. You know, like nobody gave a shit about that. Right, right. But mm -hmm. suddenly when it becomes a secret, that's when you invite shame. Mm -hmm. and, and shame is just so damaging to the psyche mm -hmm. and the soul mm -hmm. um, because God made me this way. And there's a reason I'm like this. And I, it, it allows me to do the things that I do the way that I do them. And it allows me to contribute that one unique thing to the world that only I can contribute. And why wouldn't I embrace that? Why wouldn't I celebrate that? Because mainly just because of the society I live in refuses to allow me to. And I'm grateful that I was raised by these amazing immigrant Iranian parents who taught me, even though they told me at that moment, be quiet, they had taught me every moment before that. They had said, the world will think less of you because you're a woman because of the color of your skin, because of your faith, all these bullshit reasons people will have to tell you they think less of you, this will happen to you. They will deeply underestimate you. They are wrong. So because I had that in my head, somebody who had told me before, these are bullshit reasons for people to think less of you, they are not valid. When I was in the psychiatric hospital, when I and even when my parents said, be quiet about this, I looked at them and I was like, no, no, this is another one of those reasons. <laughs> this is no different than me being a woman. This is who I am. And there's no reason for me to be ashamed of it because there's a gift in it. Um, so obviously I feel really strongly about that. And that comes through so strongly um, in your story. It, it's so empowering for me to read it as the daughter of um, a woman who 
in some ways I saw those qualities in her and this is we look generationally back um, that at that time, which was, I mean, she passed in 1984, um, but the issues were the same. But I think there's a, another piece in your, um, in the book where you talk about, you know, it's in the differences in, it's in the differences, it's in the neuro neurodiversity that there's the strength. And I saw that quality in her too. I mean, her outspokenness, her ability to, you know, not give a shit in certain yeah. situations where other normal people did. If you're already outside of the box, then you know, there's a certain freedom in yeah. that. And there's a certain intergenerational freedom in that. Um, I, I, I had a thread that I want to come back to and it has to do yeah. with, again, another a bi a bias and the bicultural mm -hmm. part of this, which also mm -hmm. is something I also identify with and coming from these super minority communities, you know, where there's a, it's important to show a certain face to the world and to sh have a show of pride and to look a certain way and to keep bury your dirty washing in you know in the backyard yeah. it's dangerous you know and i hear that and i personally was just so in so struck by the power of your sharing you were describe you were talking about the, the when you were speaking to the the, the persian ladies the iranian yeah <laughs> um yeah Mm -hmm. Shears ants, yeah. <laughs> and it means uh, lionesses. Yeah, um, the lionesses. Very strong Iranian woman. Very strong. Yeah. And you were this strong Iranian American woman speaking your truth as someone who's out and proud yeah. as bipolar and the, the power of vulnerability. Yeah. The power of vulnerability and not only the power of vulnerability for you as a woman, but in your specific intersections, um, which could, which I imagine could be very frightening. I mean, I know it is because yeah. we talked talk about it in the book, how frightening. Yeah, no, I mean, one of the hardest things. So the first book I wrote was about young Muslim Americans in an effort to fight Islamophobia um, yeah. specifically, like very overtly. So when I decided to write my second book, which is a memoir about having bipolar disorder, I was like, a little nervous about the fact that people are going to say she's Muslim because she's crazy or she's crazy because yeah. she's Muslim. And what's been so great about this third book is it's brought me back to both of them in the sense that this is a deeply um, Islamic philosophy that Rumi is promoting and that philosophy is love. And yeah. it's, and it's the kind of, and, it, and it's madness. It's this, it's the saying of there, there are two kinds of madness. There is a kind that Rumi promotes and that is the kind that is rooted in love. And that's what makes, makes a mystic. And then there's the kind that's rooted in fear. And we're seeing a lot of that yes. um, around the world, that this is the kind rooted in fear is in love with borders and walls. Mm -hmm. The kind rooted in love is in love with bridges, right? Um, unity and and so the one creates a mystic one creates a lunatic or a fundamentalist ultimately yes. right yes um and these things both come from a kind of madness so my hope is if we're going to get crazy which all of us are at this point, sorry like we're living in a country and it's funny because i know other people who have mental health conditions who are like don't call donald trump crazy and i'm like no he's crazy he's a fundamentalist and that's that's where he fits and then there's the other side of it where you can find the mystics right those are the people who will pull us out of it and i promise you none of them are politicians <laughs> yes unfortunately they're artists a lot of them not that right. i'm biased <laughs> so um you've raised the the current situation now uh, uh, you know what we're challenged by right now in this pandemic and i just went to the book and um i'm looking at that chapter on depression that you wrote and the virus when your father um I don't know if you have if you if you want me to read it, I can just read it. Um, sure. Yeah. So what page are you on? You are we are on page 87. Okay. Um and it's about it's at the heart of what you're really talking about. You know, can is there really such a thing as fixing? Mm -hmm. Or is there really just a path to wholeness through the challenges and the having to come back again and again and again and seeing ourselves as those mosaics that keep getting our pieces moved around and yeah. broken and reset into more and more beautiful, unexpected ways. I don't know, could, would you read it? Would be nice sure, to yeah, it. Which, which part, you want me to start at the top of 87? Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, so the poem itself is, um, hmm. Yeah, so it's the up. poem, yeah, the, so uh, this is, I think, the, the section where I'm talking about the friend of mine who I'd lost to suicide. Um, and I say, and my dad tells me a poem of where there is treasure, snakes come round, where there are roses, thorns abound, in the grand bazaar of life, joy without sorrow cannot be found. Um, and I say, but how does that help, having just lost my friend to suicide? Sure, you can have, you can't have good without bad, so what? How does that fix anything? And my father says, it does not fix anything. Only it helps you understand. Nothing can fix this. In this case, losing my friend to suicide, Melody John. And John means uh, dear, but also soul in Farsi. Um, already you know that, but your friend is not lost. You see her again. Now you have to take care of yourself. Listen to Molana, which means our master. And it's what we call Rumi uh, in Iran. He says, reciting Rumi as he once again ignores the fact that I'm trying to cancel our lesson and not expedite it. For a viable, and this is Rumi, for a viable cure, pain is the key, your injury invites the remedy. In medicine, a cure does not come from nowhere, Ahmed continues. The disease teaches you the cure. Think of the polio vaccine. It comes from the polio virus. And so many vaccines, they work this way. Think of Ebola or smallpox. They can kill all of us. Human being thinks they are so big, so important. But really, you ask any physician and they tell you we are nothing compared to one tiny virus. If you want to stop a virus, you must appreciate its genius. Only then can you learn from it. So, <laughs> I didn't know how prescient that would be. <laughs> right. Yeah. How are you holding that now? When you read that back now, how are you, what comes to you in this circle, right? You talk, you started talking earlier about, we don't know what the lessons are. You know, yeah. we don't know what got seeded way back when. Are there any, any connections that you're making now as you read, read in this moment, those words? Yeah, yeah, no, I think the best thing, I think, there's so many, so much grief around this. There's so, and this whole chapter that this is from is about grief. Yeah. Um, and to see that having, having lost so much life, like it's, it's hard to say to anybody who's lost a loved one, like there's a reason for this there, you know, it's, it's very hard to understand that or say that and accept it in any way. Um, but I do think as a society, there's a big lesson we need to learn in terms of how we treat each other as foreigners. When a virus sees no foreigner, <laughs> there's, there's no foreigner for a virus, there's just a human <laughs> and, and it will take you and it will come into your cells and replicate. It doesn't care what your background is. Um, despite the fact that people from certain backgrounds are more vulnerable, but that's because of the society we live in and that we've made these people more mm -hmm. vulnerable because they're marginalized in our mm -hmm. societies. Um, but reading it now, I, I definitely, I, I mean, I know things happen for a reason. There's a lot I learned from virology in general uh, during this, um, during the writing of this book. And there's a lot of virology that's in the book. Um, <laughs> Oddly, oddly enough, I don't believe in right. coincidences. I'm sure it, it happened for a reason, but I won't say that like when I realized my book was being released in the midst of a pandemic that I was like, great, this is, we need this. I was not excited when my publicist at Penguin was like, we're all working from home. I was like, no, please keep working. Um, you, when they were like, we can't mail your books out to people, sorry. Like all of that, I just thought, or when Amazon was like, we can't mail books for weeks instead of two days, right? We got so used to receiving things as quickly as we needed them. Um, and then we suddenly there's scarcity, you know? <laughs> but all the lessons that, um, that I learned and keep learning throughout the book keep popping up during this, um, during this experience. And I've needed, and I wrote the book, like all of my books, I write the book that I need. Um, and I really needed this uh, earlier in my life. I wrote the book that I needed earlier, but I, now I'm finding uh, a lot of comfort in it right now. Um, not because I've reread it, because I haven't, but because my readers keep coming back to me and reminding me. Um, and my dad keeps coming back to me. He's like, well, you said this in chapter whatever. Like, you, you have the wisdom. And ultimately that's the lesson of this book. 
um, it's not a specific piece of wisdom. It's the knowledge that that wisdom is already within you. And you don't need to purchase anything to get it. Right. You don't need to go anywhere to get it. Right. Um, Rumi has a poem where he said, uh, says, why seek pilgrimage at some distant shore when the beloved is right next mm -hmm. door, right? Now right. we can find the beloved at home, literally. Exactly. <laughs> at home. I was just thinking like, you know, following this through to its logic, through its logic. Yes, this is when your book is being published. Yeah, of course. <laughs> How brilliant is that? How amazing is that? There's nothing to be done. The books will arrive when they arrive. And look at us. Look how amazing an opportunity it gave for us to be here in our living rooms yeah. with however many people distributed throughout who even knows where. And I have no idea who's here. Yeah. I yeah. know. Yes. Yeah, yeah. In, in, in one location in San Francisco, we wouldn't be reaching so many people in our conversation. Yeah, across borders, right? Across borders, right. That virus, thank you. You know, yeah. to thank you, virus, for your ill, for the spring, <laughs> but for bringing us together. For and the, that's what trauma does, and that's that that, that goes back to your work, I think, because your yeah. work is so based in that. It, that the, these crises, these horrible yes. events in our lives, are opportunities. Yes, and we can see them that way, and there yes. there are opportunities to reconnect. Exactly, with our own and this notion of you know intergenerational trauma is. Yes. So prevalent, like we we talk about it a lot and it's totally valid, but I wouldn't be alive if it weren't for intergenerational resilience. My That's parents right. survived that shit, you know, yes. like I, the fact that yes. they made it here and they're, that I'm still here despite revolution and war and imperialism, right. we still made it through that and we're still here. So there's a way of not focusing on the trauma or at least using the trauma. Yes. To, to to bear out that resilience. Absolutely. You know, in our program, we have a very strong emphasis on um, collective, what we call co collective practices. And it's, and it's, I think all of us in our core faculty are from more collectivist kinds of backgrounds. So it's, it's somehow in the DNA of, of, of the we. And it's, it's uh, thank goodness, because we, we need the we in all of this. This is, you know, this, if this wakes us up to the fact that we, their individualism is a, is a figment of our imagination. Yes. I don't know yeah. what else would, you know, as you say, this, this invisible virus, it, it will take us all down. It can take yeah. us all down. And yes, it affects us in different ways. And according to our social positions that pre-existed yeah. this and it's really and it can wake us all up too and it can wake us all up and the other connection i made with this with the idea of the prescriptions which i love that it's you know ruby's prescriptions it says there's a trend that's um i think originally originated out of the uk where i'm originally from of um uh social art on prescription now mm -hmm. that's coming out oh of, really uh, yes uh, and it's funded and it's happening that people, the doctors are giving arts and social prescriptions instead of medications oh, or in addition to medicine. Yeah, yeah. And how brilliant that is and how it felt like your, your work is really congruent with that and the larger culture, the shift towards thinking about arts and what's life affirming as the prescription rather than the medication, which is about suppression of symptoms. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we, manage symptoms but allow for joy how do we mm. do both of those things it's not about the buy it's about the integration and it's I, you know i think the for me the best treatment separate from just love but the best treatment for me has been insight um and that's those calls that i keep getting from people it's from people who have family members who refuse to acknowledge that they have a condition that needs some sort of treatment yeah. whether however they they want to treat it because they've been told this is a condition you'll have for the rest of your life you'll have to take this medication for the rest of your life like they're you're told this stuff as opposed to this is a condition we don't understand at all uh we don't know what causes it we have no idea why the medications that work and don't work work and don't work they some work a lot better and worse than others some actually right. induce the symptoms yes. of the things we're trying to exactly. treat yeah. you know but just be honest with yeah. me and that that lack of honesty and that sort of uh patriarchal attitude of like we know what this is when you absolutely don't know and what i love about my current psychiatrist i actually wrote 
a piece years ago in the New York Times about him, uh, where I said like, what impressed me most about, and this is like a Harvard and Yale educated psychiatrist. And what impressed me most about him in that first meeting was how many times he said, I don't know. <laughs> Cause I never heard a psychiatrist say that, right? Yes. Uh, and that's all I needed yes. to hear. I yes. didn't need the answer. I just yes. needed him to be like, I don't know. We don't yes. know. You're a human being. Let's treat you. Yes, exactly. Right. We have a phrase in our program. I don't know, but together we do. Mm. And we've started ask, doing it as a mantra for the students that come in to say it to each other oh when God. help me, help me, help me. What's wrong with me? I don't know, but together That's we do. Together. It's something about that collaboration and the real trust that it's the person who's sitting in front of us who has the wisdom if we can hold the space for them to feel into all of that brokenness. And that's where the arts come in because we can externalize, we can put into art, we can put into movement, we can put into poetry, writing, you know, you taught yeah. creative writing <laughs> in psychiatric units, which is yeah. another whole thing I'm not sure we're gonna have to have the time for, but I'd yeah. love to talk about it offline. So so to not lose a couple of really things that I really wanted to, to um, get to. One of them was, yes, this, you know, what is it about now? And there's been a movement in the last maybe 10 years towards this sort of reclaiming our ancestors, reclaiming ancestral wisdom, feeling the um, thinness of the conventional health system, that there's really mm -hmm. been a trend towards that. And it's also um, revealed the limitations of the United States homogenization process. Mm -hmm. so we find that there's for a lot of our white students from European backgrounds feel that they have this idea that they don't have a culture. Mm -hmm. And so they, they run off to an ashram. Right, run <laughs> off to an ashram or adopt. You know, it's that line between where's the line between universalism and particularism? Where's the line between leaning into Rumi's poetry and, you know, I don't know <laughs> what it might be. Yeah. Like. Well, you know, the way I see it, it's whatever brings you close to the beloved, take it. But what I see is Rumi is the fastest path for me because I am Persian through and through. Yeah. Um, I'm Muslim. Like they, there's, I have the same background as he does. I speak the same language. That's where I come from. And if my father were not Persian and not in love with Rumi, then I would have written this book about another mystic, right? Like uh, somebody else, because every culture has them. Um, and my my point in writing this book was, and I say toward the end of it, that I'm not writing this book to tell you my story. Yes, I'm writing it to encourage you to tell yours. Yes, um, thank you for that. I, that I was gonna re ask you to read that piece out because that really, <laughs> that was like the beginning felt like, the end felt like the beginning. Like I love yeah. that you ended with that because it really was that invitation. And that sense that it might be painful to unveil the past stories yeah. because, but it's important. Again, it's like those stories might be ones of finding that your ancestors were at were oppressors. That's true. right. All at all, but you know, it's what's in the truth, and again, what's in the healing that happens through that journey and digging back beyond that as and well. owning it, whatever and it is, it. really owning yeah. it, and yeah. And if, if you do have oppressors in your history, then figuring that out, figuring yeah. out, I mean, there, there are ways to, um, I, I do think that we carry other generations within yes. us and we work out their traumas within us. Yes, and exactly. if you have old generations that were oppressing others in really harsh ways and you are damaged in one way or another, could it not be that your line needs to pay some reparations. And when you do, that's how you get healing. We just, yeah. we don't understand in our society that like antidepressants don't all, always, we call antidepressants drugs, um, but sometimes the best antidepressants are actions. Um, and, the, and the argument is when you're that depressed and there is a deep level of depression where you, you can't act. Um, but I, you know, the only time that I've ever attempted suicide was after taking an antidepressant that gave me the motivation to mm -hmm. act on my emotions. Mm -hmm. I know depression is not a problem for me because without, without any motive, like I'm not motivated, I won't do anything. <laughs> so the, the drug actually induced the thing that it was supposed to prevent, you know, so at the same time, there are drugs that have saved me and pulled me out of it, but you, you have to use them consciously and thoughtfully 
and engage in a partnership with yeah. someone else as, as an equal, as opposed to a patient um, yes. who must be patient. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and not ask questions, you know. Such an important point to remember. And um, I'm involved right now with um, a project through the North American Arts and Health Organization, which is um, a healthcare, prov health, health, it's working with healthcare providers, as you might be really interested in hearing about yeah. this, um, nationally. And actually there are international movements as well, but we're currently working on a, a project that's raising money for, um, helping healthcare professionals who are struggling so much. And a lot because yeah. of this having to be the experts, having to have it all together, when in fact, so many healthcare providers are having to make unethical, ethical yeah. decisions that feel unethical, yeah. that are hurting their soul. And there's nowhere to discuss it or talk about it. So what we're trying to do is raise money to uh, create arts-based practices but as medicine for healthcare workers. So this oh, idea great. Of, of um healthcare workers as artists and as creators. I love that. It's very exciting. And I think it's also part, it follows what you're saying. And also the story of your friend who mm. you who you talked about. It seemed like there was so much pain that because she was seen as being so together or yeah. so such a presence for other people, her own yeah. pain went unnoticed. And I think that's, this is a moment when we're seeing that, that yeah. frontline folks are the people who are doctors, nurses, janitors, mm -hmm. healthcare, shoppers, people who are working in shops mm -hmm. are the people who are getting this disease and they were never credited before. And how do we create, create spaces of health? Mm. And, the, and the people who are keeping us alive are the people who are making less than minimum wage. Like yes. these are the people who, if you think this has nothing to do with labor, like this has right. everything to do with labor, hopefully this will force us to recognize yes. that these are valuable oh people doing valuable work that yes. needs to be compensated right. accordingly. And unless those of us who are purchasing that actually stand up for them, then it's not gonna happen. We really need to acknowledge that these people saved our lives by driving food to our house, by right. working well, in the these supermarket. Are, these are new conversations that this virus has actually made possible. Yeah. So that's interesting. I know we don't have a lot of yeah. time left, so I wanted to get to another part of the book that was that stood out for me because again we're saying this is what yeah. stood out for me and it was about because I work in a school ed, you know I'm an educator I'm in yeah. higher education and this question this juxtaposition sometimes between anger righteous anger mm -hmm. right and you know social justice and righteous anger mm -hmm. somehow go together and then there's compassion and love on the other hand mm -hmm. and I identified with that both personally in my own journey you know my own sort of adolescent rebellious voice which can be very uncompassionate and my yeah. own evolution and then seeing that often in my students mm. um and really hearing that in these in i love that chapter about love and anger and there's um a piece that amused me when you talked about being a, a, an ally in the queer um muslim conference yeah and you talked about meeting your pseudo doppelganger <laughs> well i love the yeah. phrase <laughs> And um, how hard that was. Can you say a little bit about? I'm, yeah, I'm sorry, little so bit. I was invited to, yeah, I was invited to this uh, amazing organization. I encourage y'all to look it up. It's called Masjid, the Muslim Alliance for Sexual and Gender Diversity. Um, and I was invited to do this mental health workshop for like two hours, uh, I, not knowing that I was the only straight cisgender <laughs> um, person coming with my husband, a straight white cisgender man. Um, so sort of invading the space in a way, but I didn't know that that was happening. I just knew that I was invited and I showed up because this is a community that, you know, for my writing, I've received death threats. And the only death threats I've ever received were for this being part of the queer jihad movement, fighting for LGBTQ rights from an Islamic perspective. Um, and being insistent about that. So I earned my place there, right? Like I, I had earned my place there as an ally, but even still, I was so righteous about my allyship. You know, I thought I was so good at it and I knew what I was talking about. And at the end, there was a woman who just looked just like me and came up to me and was like, I'm really unhappy with the ways I use the word crazy, which is 
the way the dictionary <laughs> uses it, but she, she was unhappy with that. She was unhappy with all these other things. And as she was talking, I just noticed that physically I was distancing myself from her. Uh, and she looked so much like me that it was so obvious that in the thing that was, and I started getting so angry and was I, and it wasn't that I was angry and I, I not that I showed it to her, um, but within I was just seething um, and it was all ego. I realized that this is, there's no righteousness to any of this anger right now because she's entitled to the space to herself. She's entitled to feel like I'm invading it because I am. She's entitled to have her opinions about what I have to say. And I would defend them on, on any other day if I weren't me <laughs> standing here, you know what I mean? But my ego is like getting in the way of all of this. And my father's take and Rumi's take is all of uh, anger, so much of anger. I don't buy that all of it because I'm, I'm still a big fan of Audre Lorde. I think anger has uses, but um, I also yeah. think that so much of our anger is from ego. We're angry not because um, the right thing is not happening, but because the thing we want is not happening, the thing we think is right is not happening. And I see that in the lack of conversation across political parties uh, in this country right now, especially. Yes. She also struck me as your doppelganger. I don't know if you meant, maybe you did mean this in this way, in that I, I hear in the book you, you struggling with your own righteous anger, right? Mm -hmm and your own yeah. experiments in leaning into Rumi wisdom, like you, you describe, yeah. you know, oh, you don't look like a Muslim, that, <laughs> that whole part. And, you know, you, you back, you checking yourself and like, well, I'm not gonna go into what my normal right. rap would be around this. So I was also thinking about her as your doppelganger and like mirroring back, sense. you know, her righteous indignation at you. That was, also, that's also part of ego. Yeah, right? absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Hmm. I didn't intend to write it like that, but I'm glad that you caught it. I'm glad it showed up. <laughs> yeah. That's how I kind of read it. Yeah. Um, it reminded me of a time when I was in Boston and um, I was out with who I thought was a friend, who a, a male guy. I thought this is going to going to somewhere great. Who I it thought was a friend. Great. I thought he was inviting me out for, wanted to get to know me. I met him at a conference. He was a mental health mm -hmm. worker and we we're hanging out. And then he asked me out for a date. I'm like, but I have a girlfriend. And he said, you don't look like a lesbian. <laughs> and I was not as evolved as you at the time. I said to him, really? I thought you were gay. <laughs> Which wasn't really true. Which wasn't, but, uh, but you know it got I, I was not in my higher power at that moment, but. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so we just have, oh, we have five, I think we have five minutes. Um, a breath. Yeah, a breath. Let's see. Let's. What's? Where are we now? Where are we now? And where are we in the relation to the mystery in this moment? I'm saying the mm. mystery in terms of what that was one of the things we wanted to invite in, in terms of Rumi. Where just let it let it unfold. You know, where mm. are we now? Where's this conversation taken us? My um. During all of this, while we were talking, other things are happening around me. My cat is uh -huh. sitting right here. Oh, hi. <laughs> Your cat. My husband is over there. <laughs> Our neighbor knocked on the door recently to be like, it is pouring rain down downstairs and your car, your passenger window is open. You may want to pull it up. You've managed that all incredibly well. Oh, all, yeah, all of that happening. But the I just, I'm, you ask in this moment, in this moment, I'm thinking like, I can't believe I left the window down in the middle of a storm. Um, I don't know, something about leaving the window down in the middle of a storm is striking me. Um, yeah. Anyway, that, that's what I'm thinking about. That's what's hitting me right now. And no damage was done. My husband went and pulled it up and it was okay. It wasn't that. Sitting okay. through it. Yeah. Sitting, sitting through it. it. And it didn't, yeah. it really didn't seem from the outside like anything was, any storm <laughs> was hitting. Well, thank God for the neighbor because it would have been <laughs> open all night, right? So the beloved is right next door and comes upstairs and knocks sometimes to say, hey, you were kind of dumb when you parked your car today. Mm -hmm. Well, it, <laughs> in the because we have a couple of minutes and I wanted to go back to the uh, the end of your book which felt like the beginning um maybe to um to actually do that 
pull out the page that I found. Um, if I can give you the page, can you read yeah, it? Yeah, sure, absolutely. It is page, page 234, mm -hmm. where you're talking about um, trading intellect for intuition from there. Mm -hmm. Sure. So this chapter is about pride and ego. That's the yeah. diagnosis here. Trading intellect for intuition by accepting my father's guidance while finding Rumi's prescriptions for myself, filling Rumi's prescriptions for myself and prioritizing love above all else, I am slowly learning to quit reducing myself to my thoughts and achievement, to quit comparing myself to others carefully curated Facebook personas, to quit striving for perfection to the point of creative stagnation, and to quit chronically trusting reason over faith. By returning to my roots, to my parents, to my heart, to the beloved, I have discovered a newfound sense of love and gratitude for where I come from, personally, culturally, and spiritually. Applying that to myself and the world around me by filling Rumi's prescriptions has helped me reduce the wanting insecurity, ego, and ambition that first led me on this journey. In the process, it has also mercifully reignited my creative spark, bringing me back from a madness far more common and insidious than manic depression, back from the trappings of my ego, back from fear and insecurity, back to the joy of creating for its own sacred sake, not my own errant egocentric one. <laughs> that seems like a really great place to leave this. Yeah. Thank you so much for this conversation. I had such a great time. Thank you too, me too. Let's see what um, questions we have yeah. coming for us. Okay, questions. Could you please comment on the role of emotions and seemingly growing pressure buy-in for false positivity, a pressure that is distancing from authenticity of the human experience? Mm. for <laughs> just be positive <laughs> is, is that is that is that pressure um I see that pressure not just with positivity but with, with, with productivity too like I think it's um noxious it's toxic um and it, because it's not like if you don't authentically feel and I and I write about it in the book um if you don't authentically feel your emotions you can't get through them um Rumi has a poem where he says, honey is only sweet because you've tasted vinegar. Um, you won't know the difference <laughs> otherwise, right? Um, and the idea that like somebody with manic depression, like I, I have this sides of main, you know, joy and depression apparently higher than a lot of so-called normal people. And I can go lower than a lot of so-called normal people. And guess what? I can still survive it. And I can mm -hmm. tell you that those different planes of reality Mm -hmm. have all taught me something mm -hmm. too and feeling them has taught me something and fighting mm -hmm. them every time I tried to run away from them they got worse mm -hmm. um and one of the things that my father and I write about in the book says specifically is that crying is the best sedative on earth there are no side effects there's no, like there's nothing but you know you go to a psychiatrist I've never had other than the great one I'm with now that I was saying I wrote about who actually was like, no, just cry. It's okay. Like go. And I remember being in one of these facilities where I was teaching and being livid because one of the patients who is an inpatient psychiatric on a locked ward with no windows, by the way, no music, no beauty, no nothing, um, sitting in this ward and she's crying. And this health tech says to her before my writing workshop begins, says, you know, if you keep crying, I'm going to have to take you to your to your room, you won't be able to partake in this workshop. And I lost it on this health tech to the point that I'm glad that they didn't keep me in there because I was like, no, why mm -hmm. are you stopping her from doing the one thing that's gonna mm -hmm. help her? You just pumped her full of mm -hmm. these drugs that are killing her and yeah. you're not letting her do the one natural thing her body knows to do. And right. I, I insisted that she sit there and we sat with her. Um, and to me, that's, I mean, that's the kind of thing that we need to thank do is just actually feel those emotions. Yes. And thank goodness you were there in that yeah. case. Yeah. And all the times that 
this suppression of emotion, this natural healing process is being suppressed. Yeah. Um, in a psychiatric I, hospital of all places. In a psychiatric I mean, hospital. Ugh. Yeah. And if this wisdom, the wisdom of the mystics is exactly that, and it seems to be across traditions, you know, there's a teaching in Jewish mysticism, you have to, uh, you have to descend to ascend. Mm. You have to go down to come up. You, you know, it's like this by everything is about what, you know, yeah. calling it bipolar rather than it's like, yeah about the integration of opposites yes you know and so much of the mystical teachings i think in all the three yeah. well not just in the three monotheistic yeah. mystical traditions it yeah. has to do with that integration rather than the fear and separation yeah and I, I i actually i didn't ask you this question but i was thinking about iranian american like that bipolarity yeah. of like you know what is the american voice what is the american yeah. voice doing to the iranian voice you know yeah, I often say I'm 100% Iranian, 100% American, because that's exactly how I feel. Yeah. And I've had so many, like, don't read the comments, but I read the comments sometimes and people are just viciously scared of that possibility. And I love how much it scares people, because it's like, no, I'm both of these things. As if we have to keep right and it's just yep. it, it ruins your whole, it ruins all those borders and boundaries, you know, yes. to, and, and I'm right all about doing that and that's the reason that you know that's the reason i'm an such a you know an ally to the lgbtq community or any community who i see being seriously marginalized to the point that they're you know as a lawyer especially it makes me upset to see that lawyer basic human art. rights another yeah. one <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly a lawyer artist <laughs> they work together i promise <laughs> we can see that yeah. <laughs> for sure Okay, next question. You mentioned in your book that we keep forgetting our wisdom. How can we get better at remembering? Um, you should have reminders all around you. Okay. Literal, remi I mean, seriously, literal reminders uh, is something that's been helpful to me. I mean, like women who, or what, men who wear yarmulkes or women who cover their hair, like these are, it's not about the fabric. It's about having a physical reminder Mm -hmm. um or even mm -hmm. a necklace or whatever like mm -hmm. something that's physical we're such physical beings mm -hmm. and we're so tied to that um that it helps i think to have something outside of ourselves and 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 to 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 what uh, personally like when i pray i often find myself praying inside my own head and i i've had to try really hard to pray out loud um because it I, I, when I'm inside my own head, there's, there's room for thoughts to trickle in. Mm -hmm. But when I'm speaking right now, like I can't mm -hmm. think of anything other than what I'm saying to right to you right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's easier. So when I'm speaking to God, why should it be any different? I should be more focused, not less. So, um, I don't know. I hope, I hope that helps somewhat, but I think it's different for everyone, but I do think like having something I mean, physical like tangible and reminder. yeah, exactly. I'm curious what it was like for Melody to decide to be public with her diagnosis. You know, as an activist, it was not a huge decision. I, I had to, I realized that this is a group of people who are being discriminated against. Now I'm a member of this group, shit, right? Like, <laughs> like but I didn't know. I didn't know how bad the discrimination was until I was in the hospital right. where I realized Right. Oh my God, I've lost every ounce of credibility yeah. I've ever had. All of my medical records from this, like one of my facilities I was at over and over, they had written like patient has delusions that she's an author and a lawyer. Like they don't even think you, you can do the things you've already done. And then when you, I left that facility, I was told to like lower my expectations for my life because I would never amount to anything. Um, meanwhile, they, this was the same hospital where they had, you know, at the end of my records, when I, I'd been threatening to sue them the whole time I was there, like they crossed off the part where it's like patient believes she's an right. author and a lawyer. They just crossed off believes like, oh, oops, patient is an author and a lawyer. Like it has not that to be it matters. Yeah. Right. Not that it matters, but right. I, the, the point is if your, your job is to help me distinguish mm -hmm. between delusion and reality, you can't bother to Google me to like, figure right. it out or ask my parents or ask my husband so actually, you know sort of they were delusional about the possibility yeah because they, they don't had think a we're kind capable. of delusional yeah. disorder Delus delusional psychiat psychiatrist disorder yeah. was operating for them <laughs> at the time <laughs> the two must be mutually exclusive yeah it's been said that Rumi is the founder of the whirling dervishes if that's so 
He used movement to reach ecstatic states. Could you comment on the link between movement mm. and mystic states? Great yes. Question. Yeah. I'm a hooper. Is there any other hoopers here? Hello. Yeah. We're together. Um, I hula hoop. Okay. I, I have a hoop on my wall right now. If I turned, I could technically turn. Can you see my hula hoop? No. Uh, oh yes. There you can yes, see it. We can see it. But light shining in my face, so you can't. But so I'm a hooper, and I'm a big fan of uh, the spinning motion as well. Um, because it, it tends to tends to work for me, but I think movement and music, and we actually wanted to, Shoshana wisely wanted to start this whole session with music so that we could pull ourselves out of our left brains a little bit. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so this isn't something, it's funny like talking about stuff that's not supposed to be intellectualized, it's supposed to be felt. Right. Um, and the, the way that you feel it is through getting out of your thoughts and not thinking um, and, that movement allows you to do that. And it allows you to express joy. Um, I'm a big fan of dance as well. And music, obviously, I have no talent for it because the curse of being named Melody is that you have no talent for music, but I love it. I love it anyway. So what's your rumor prescription for folks living alone in quarantine, which can feel like the solitary confinement you're mm -hmm. talking about? I bet One you have a chapter on isolation. Yeah, I do. Chapter two. First off, please remember this feeling. There is someone right now, and as bad as it is, you're in your home, you have a clock, you have access to music, you have access to, to poetry, to, to art, to, to different things that when I was in isolation, when all the people who are sitting right now in solitary confinement in this country don't have access to any of that feel that fully, feel what that's like and take action when we get out of this because we shouldn't be doing, it's torture what we're doing to people. I spent one day, one day in solitary and I still have nightmares about it. Wow. Um, so one, let that bring your empathy out and your action out so that when this ends, you say, this is not okay to force onto other people. We will not do this to human beings. Um, Recognize that we are social beings, do not do this to people. So that's separate, we're connected, that's separate. But in terms of what he says, the cure for isolation is it's community. And how do you build community when you can't be with somebody else, right? Um, it's within your, your own heart, within the beloved within you. And for me and for so many others, the way that you find that is through creating. Um, Rumi's solution to isolation is to invent, not to imitate. Often in order to build community, we try and be like someone else. We try and imitate someone else so we'll fit into that community. And Rumi says, don't. Rumi says, you have something valuable that's specific to you, do that thing. Create that thing, create that art, whatever it is, whether it's music, whether it's um, needlepoint, <laughs> whether it's you know chocolate mousse, wh whatever it is that you can create and bring yourself to create, do that. and and do it even if you're not good at it. Do it especially if you're not good at it because when you're not good at it, you're able to pull the ego out of it and you're able to do it just for the joy of it. So for me, my, my treatment of isolation is never in writing because writing is work for me, even though it's also prayer for me, it's work, it's hard. And I, I'm specific about the way I want my writing to sound and to, I'm, I edit, you know? But when I sing, I don't care because <laughs> I'm not trying to sing for anybody. No one's going to record it. No one cares. It's horrible. I'm so bad at it, but I love it. Um, so create that. Sing however you sing. And Rumi has another poem where he says, uh, though the song of the nightingale you may learn to compose, you'll never know what it sings to the rose. Don't learn someone else's song. Sing your own song. So Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> In your book, Melody, you mentioned that you cannot go into the women's prayer area in the mosque. How do you personally integrate the divisive nature of Islam in this? So in the United States, I can't. In most mosques, I can't. In Iran, actually, there are mosques where I can. Ask a question of why that would be. You, you think of Iran as being backwards and whatever else people think about Iran. But no, I have been in 
uh, integrated mosques with men and women in Iran, I have never been in that situation in an official mosque in the US. Um, that personally, my belief is that there's, a, who is our closest ally in the Middle East um, outside of Israel is Saudi Arabia. Um, their money, so Iranian money can't make its way into the US in the same way that Saudi money can. There is influence on these mosques. That's why I also encourage people never to, I, it hurts me when I think of somebody saying, I'm going to a mosque to learn about Islam. And I think it would hurt Rumi to say, I'm going to anywhere other than a mountain or an ocean <laughs> to learn about God. You know why? God doesn't need a house to be built for, for it. Um, so that I think, and it's, there's nothing divisive about Islam. Islam means peace. It's about unity. It's about love. Uh, what's divisive is how some Muslims interpret it in the same way that there's nothing divisive about Christianity, but there is something divisive about the way the KKK interprets uh, Christianity, for instance, right? Um, or in any, you know, this could be applied to any faith. Uh, and, and in terms of the gender divisions, um, it's worth remembering within Islam that there would be no Islam if it weren't for Khadija, so coming to madness. So the Prophet Muhammad uh, received the revelation, it's, it's Ramazan, so received the revelation of the Quran supposedly in this month. Um, and when he did, when it was the angel Gabriel revealed uh, the Quran to him, he ran to his wife Khadija, who was much older than him, who was his boss, um, <laughs> Who, who was um, the most powerful businesswoman in Mecca who probably couldn't exist in modern day Saudi Arabia. He ran to Khadija, he said, I've lost my mind. And Khadija said, no, this is a new religion. And Khadija became the first convert to Islam. So without that woman, there would be no Islam. <laughs> Um, and, and all of the, all of the faiths ultimately without women, they would not exist, That's right. but she was the first convert, right? Like, and she's, she's lost in history. Um, so I think going back to that history and then the sadness of thinking Khadija could be in the, you know, six, seventh century, what, working on the numbers, but 700, um, to, to be in the seventh century, to be in Saudi Arabia and being able to be the most like a businesswoman, a really functioning businesswoman where right now it's not entirely possible to do that uh, as a woman in Saudi Arabia. So we're, we haven't evolved quite as much as, as you would hope um, on both sides. And I think we also have to remember that the American money that keeps going into Saudi Arabia that also you know fosters the destruction and the murder of Yemeni children, for instance, um, and the gender apartheid that exists in that country there's a lot of American money and American weapons that are going there. And as Americans, if I'm assuming this question is an American because we're in America, but that's a bad assumption to make. So if you're an American, those of you who are, let's remember it's our country that's supporting um, the, the, this version of Islam, the Wahhabi version of Islam, which is not Islam at all, um, but a serious perversion and a politicization of a faith that nearly a quarter of the population has. So it's an easy thing to use to manipulate people, but it's not Islam. Great, thank you. Um, there's two more questions. Would you feel comfortable talking about how you met your husband and got married in the midst of living with depression bipolar? I often think I'm too busy healing to invite a journey partner. Mm. So, I didn't invite a journey partner. I think when you look for something, it's hard to find, but if you're not looking for it, it's, it's when it finds you. I met my husband when I was, we've been married almost 20 years now. I met him my first year of college. I had no intention of, I had never really dated. Um, and I, I was busy. I had other things to do. After that pancreatic tumor, I almost died. Mm -hmm. um, so I had books to write. I had, you know, I had things. And at that time I wasn't even had books to write. I had you know, war criminals to prosecute. Um, I had things I really wanted to do uh, that, you know, I, I didn't think a partner would help me do that. Uh, I was wrong because I because I happened to meet uh, meet my husband the way I met him. We He was a year ahead of me. We both went to Wesleyan, which is this like super artsy fartsy liberal arts school in Connecticut. Um, and he just ran after me uh, when I was leaving the library one day and was like, I noticed you. 
and I noticed you noticing me. And I'm like, I was not noticing you. I never, I was like reaching for my mace. Um, it was very much like he asked me out and, and actually got my phone number. Um, and I, I, we were, I told him that I would never date him. Uh, he told me his closest friend at school was an, another Iranian girl. And there were very few Iranians at the school. And I knew of her, but I wanted to meet her. So I used him to get to her and we became best friends, <laughs> me and me and Rixana. Um, and then I stayed friends with Matthew for a couple of years before we ever started dating. We, we were friends. We never really dated. Uh, we were living in the same house by the time we, we started dating. So um, it sort of evolved. It wasn't something I looked for. It was something that it was the greatest gift that has ever been given to me by the beloved for sure. So maybe the punchline is you don't have to wait to be invited. Mm, yeah just yeah happened. <laughs> yeah and I was I will tell you I was of all my friends I was the least one who ever wanted to partner up with anybody okay two more questions uh what does Rumi say about the healing qualities of sound hmm what does Rumi say I mean there's a lot of uh is songs of like the song of the nightingale for instance like there's songs of animals of birds um music is the, the the thing is it's not even what he says about the healing healing of qualities of sound it's the this poetry the word share uh poem in farsi is share which also means song <laughs> um so this poetry is not again it's not meant to be like read while sitting it's meant to be sung while spinning mm. you don't read this poetry you mm. sing it it's there's a reason it's rhyming mm. couplets that's why it was so important mm. to me in the book to keep the rhyming mm. um that's the reason people memorize it is because it's easy to memorize because there's all of the rhyming um and and it's often set to music uh to drums and to flutes and his primary um, the, 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 he starts off his masterpiece, the Basnavi, about the song of the reed flute torn from the reed bed. Um, and this song of being torn from the one, torn from whether, you know, in a broader sense, torn from the beloved and put into this human body on this earth um, and always wanting to go back to the reed bed. Uh, but the, the beauty of the reed flute is it can only make music uh, because it's empty. Um, and this is a lesson for us with all our thoughts in our head. Um, the most beautiful things we're able to make is when we're empty and the beloved comes through us, not when we fill ourselves up and, you know, collect stuff, which we're really good at. <laughs> yeah. Lovely. So do you have a favorite Rumi poem? Um, so it's favorite in the sense that this is my mantra. Um, when I feel like, I feel like I might not be good enough or, um, I actually, I, when I'm in an interview situation where I feel like I'm being judged in any way, um, the, the poem in Farsi is, uh, Zart halab gashti khud aval zar budi. Um, and I translated it as you went out in search of gold far and wide, but all along you were gold on the inside. Beautiful. So that, that helps me to be like, I'm fine. I'm all right. <laughs> that image is, so, is such a yeah. strong image to be able to come back to as well. That gold on the inside. Yeah. 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 Beautiful. So that's, that's our time. So it's time to thank you so much. Up. Thank you for those beautiful questions. I Wonderful really appreciate questions. it. And Alex, we're going to invite you back. Thank you so much. That was so beautiful to listen to. It was really fun to watch. Um, thank you, Alex. Thank you so much for being yeah, here today. thank you so much. I will go ahead and make you disappear. Bye. <laughs> uh, and thank you to everybody who watched tonight, who uh, attended. We hope you'll join us for more of our upcoming events. Our next one that's coming up is Missed Translations an online conversation with Sopan Deb and Alka Aurora on June 3rd at 7 p.m. U.S. Pacific time. Uh, we posted the link in the chat if you want to learn more. Um, this conversation was recorded tonight. 
If you'd like to watch it again or share it with your community, you can find it at this same link on YouTube or on our Facebook page. And I believe we're linking to those in the chat as well. Uh, we will also feature this talk on our podcast, which you can find at www.ciispod.com or by searching CIIS Public Programs on your favorite podcast app. Thank you again for joining us and have a wonderful evening.